Just under 400 years ago, the Battle of Naseby took place in these very fields on the 14th of June, 1645. We're gonna take you on a journey to all the key points of this battlefield, where you'll see everything from how they saw it back in 1645. Welcome to episode one of Battlefields of Britain. This is the Battle of Naseby. By 1645, the English Civil War, or British Civil War as it should be known, has been raging for nearly three years. Each side has won victories all over the country, but no real progress has been made, and the country is split roughly down the middle. Parliament controlled the East, South and London, and the Royalists Wales, the Midlands and the West Country. After their victory at Master Moor in July 1644, Parliament formed the New Model Army, Britain's first professional army. It was trained, paid and led only by men who possessed the skill required to lead it. The Naseby campaign begins in April 1645, when the New Model Army is ordered to march from Windsor to relieve the Siege of Taunton. When the New Model Army reaches Blandford, King Charles marches his army north from Oxford to rendezvous with Prince Rupert. On the 8th of May, the Royalists hold a council of war at Stowe-on-the-Wold, and it's decided that the Royalists would split their force. 3,000 men under Goring would ride to the West Country, with the rest of the army, numbering roughly 8,000 men, would march north. Taunton, meanwhile, had been lost, and Fairfax with the New Model Army were ordered north and then laid siege to the King's capital, Oxford, on the 22nd of May. Only a week later, the Royalists lay siege to Leicester in an effort to relieve the siege at Oxford. It works, and Fairfax marches his New Model Army north towards Leicester. Leicester, meanwhile, is sacked by the Royalists, and on the 4th of June, Charles marches his army towards Market Harbour. By the 13th of June, the day before the battle, Parliament are in Gillsborough and the Royalists are in Market Harbour, which is where our story begins. So this is Bloody Man's Ford, isn't it? It Pete? is indeed, so, yeah. You know a little bit more than I do about this, so what's, yeah. what's the significance about this Ford and its actual role in, in the Battle of Naseby? So the significance you got here is that the Royalist army were currently located in um, Market Harbour, so that's literally not even half a mile from where we're now stood, and the order for the Royalist Army was to move south. Okay. So they massed up, and they come through here. Obviously this bridge and the car park weren't here back then, <laughs> or this housing estate wasn't here back then. And uh, But you've got to imagine the whole of the Royalist Army sweeping through here, because they're moving through to go and take the high ground that's over in that direction because obviously if you've got the high ground that's the key to any battle mm. at this time you've got the high ground you're going to win the day so you'd think yes <laughs> but, um, but then the other significance of this is is that once the royalist army was in full retreat they came back in this direction obviously an army in retreat who's mm. going to be chasing you parliamentarian cavalry is going to be chasing you and they actually caught up with them here yes um, this isn't a very uh, yes, it's quite a shallow stream, river. Yeah. It's still an obstacle nonetheless. Yeah. And where the blokes are trying to get across, obviously they're, they're in disarray as well. There's no real uh, discipline going on at this point. They just want to get out because they've got the cavalry hot on their heels, but obviously the cavalry's now crashed into them and they basically cut them to pieces all in this ford here. Hence the name. Hence the name, Bloody Man's Ford. Well, should we go and occupy the high ground? Then? Let's go and occupy the <laughs> high ground. <laughs> So we're in East Farnden now, and where we are is, what, three quarters of the way up the high ground? But even at this point, coming up, the, up to the, we haven't even made it to the summit of the high ground yet, and you can already see Market Harbour mm. in the background, and you can see just a commanding view that this area has, and that's why it was so important for the Royalist Army to get up to this high ground, because just because of the view from this direction. So let's see what the view will be like when we actually get up to the battlefield. So this must be East Farndon Church, Pete. So we've just got here from Market Harbour. We have. So this was the Royalists um, rallying point you were saying. So Yes, it is. Tell me more, because I'm intrigued to know some more. So this is where um, it was decided that King Charles was going to meet his commanders. So these are blokes who, you know, he's 
uh, what we see is today is brigade commanders and corps commanders, yeah. people like that. So this was this was the focal point of where he where they were going to arrive and then receive his receive orders. Because um, remember, no radios back in those days. There's no radios, no telephones. Mm. You know, the best you got is either a runner or a galloper, and how long's a bit of string for that message to get to and from? So if he got them all into one big focal point, he'd go right. These are my orders, and that's where and that's what happened on this very spot. So we're here at East Farnham Church. Yep. We've heard about why the Royalists came here, but what happened next from here? So he's his commanders have amassed, and he's now given the order to get into line of battle. So all of his commanders are now scattered to their relevant uh, units, okay. and he's now made a battle line from here as his right flank with the cavalry on the right as well and it's now stretching all the way over to the next village because the other thing as well is he doesn't really know where the parliamentarian forces are the scouts have gone out but the scouts haven't come back so he all he knows is they are somewhere out there and they, he is going to run into them either in on the left flank or the right flank and it's a really dominating view, isn't it? It's a very there? dominating view across here, and you can see why he chose this as well, or, or, sorry, or his advisors advised him <laughs> <laughs> to use this as his viewpoint, because yeah, you're looking straight down into the battlefield, aren't you here? And thinking of a logistics point of view, you touched on it earlier about you know bringing all these guys and the, and the yeah. baggage train up, up in this direction. Now, I mean, as, as, you know, on horseback, it's not too bad, is it? You're not going to get tired, but no. on foot coming up that hill oh you're yeah. going to get a little bit tired you are because it's always harder fighting uphill than it is downhill and the pipemen wearing their armor yeah the morians cavasais musketeers you know with the, the muskets and the, the bandoliers and that you know you must, and must moving be guns as well that's the other you got mm. artillery being moved about as well so trying to move artillery uphill especially the big guns as well so so excellent so uh, where are we going from here then so i think the next best place for us to go will be prince rupert's viewpoint sounds plan let's go yeah. So Prince Rupert's viewpoint then, and it's worth saying that this has been put together by um, a group called Naseby 1645. They used yeah. to be the Na Naseby Preservation Trust or something along those lines, but mm. their aim was to preserve the battlefield and they've built fantastic viewpoints such as mm. this. So Pete, what's the significance of this particular viewpoint? So the significance of this is when we mentioned earlier that the Royalist Army had sent out scouts to try and find the Parliamentarian Army. Um, the scouts were coming back and the scouts were saying, no, I ain't found nothing. Um, so with that, Prince Rupert, who commanded the cavalry, they come under his jurisdiction, he was hearing his report saying, no, we haven't found them. He's like, well, I've got a feeling they are out there. You know, word is starting to get around and it's not from the scouts. So I'm going to go, if you want a job doing, you might as well do it yourself. So Prince Rupert took it on himself to go and have a look. So he come up on his horse, he come to this location and he looked out. And he was like, ah, I am hearing the right reports where the scouts are saying we can't see nothing because I can't see nothing over here. But what he hadn't realised, and the scouts that were going out, because the scouts that had been going out hadn't been getting close enough, and the Royalist Army were in this little gully over to our left-hand side. So, obviously, they don't want to get too close or they're going to end up captured or shot at. So, but what he then saw was he saw movement going from left to right. And what that was, that was the new modern army, or the parliamentarians getting into their battle line so where we've got this ridge I think looking at the maps that's where he saw them so they're not because remember all these hedge lines and a lot of these trees weren't here then so he would have had quite a, quite a clear view even though you know we're sort of on level ground now at, the, at this high ground he saw them cut, cutting across from that left to right he's like right there they are so with that the royalist army is now doing almost a sort of a snaking movement so everything's now sort of heading in that direction and over there is where the battlefield will be we are now going to venture over to the parliamentary lines and see what they were up to on the morning of the 14th of june 1645 starting at the obelisk monument steve this obelisk is quite dominating so what's the importance of this position we're at now so this nowadays of course is the obelisk monument now back in 1645 this was one of the most prominent um, buildings on the skyline so silhouetted against the sky was Naseby Windmill and this is the site of Naseby Windmill mm -hmm. and you can see some of the remnants of it here yeah. and it's got a kind of little moat around the outside but of course the uh, the windmill fell into disrepair 
and um, obviously post-battle the obelisk was uh, erected as a monument to the battle but back in 1645 um, at 0300 hours on the 14th of June so very very early uh, morning on, on the day of the battle uh, this was used as the muster point for the parliament forces so much like the royalists did with East Farnham Church yeah. the parliamentarians did the same with Naseby Windmill the parliamentarians were very well prepared for, for the battle. They knew there was going to be a battle. Mm. Their scouts had gone out and had identified the Royalist army were, were out and about. The Royalists, of course, had laid siege to, uh, to Leicester. The parliamentarians drew them away. The Royalists, as you've mentioned, as you're well aware, didn't particularly know uh, where the parliamentarian army was. And the mm. Royalists, on the night of the 13th of June, so the night before the battle, had actually sent um, so, some scouts out and they'd made it as far as the village of Naseby. Mm -hmm. They never returned because those scouts were actually intercepted by parliamentarian scouts and captured. Moving half a mile to the north, we arrive at Fairfax's viewpoint. This is where Cromwell and Fairfax rode forward to try and discover where the Royalists were and what they were up to. So where we are now then, Steve, we, must, we are definitely on the Parliament's lines, aren't we, here? We are indeed. So um, we are at what's called Fairfax's viewpoint. And as the name suggests, this is where Black Tom, or Sir Thomas Fairfax, mm -hmm. uh, this is a position he stood. Uh, and he looked out over towards Broadmoor and saw the Royalist Field Army ready to, to give battle. So scouts were sent out and, and Parliament moved mm -hmm. its army from this position uh, westwards. And they ended up ultimately uh, where we now know as the battlefield of Naseby itself. From this vantage point, Cromwell and Fairfax could see the Royalist army moving and ordered their new model army to shadow their movements. This brought them to the north side of Naseby village and down onto Broadmoor. At the same time, Rupert, who had rode forward to what is now known as Rupert's viewpoint, saw the new model army moving towards Broadmoor and Rupert ordered his army to form up in line of battle at Dust Hill, facing the new model army across Broadmoor. The next stop on our journey is Broadmoor itself, where the battle in the main was fought, and today the Cromwell Monument stands on the site in commemoration of the battle. On Dust Hill, the Royalists formed up, with cavalry on the flanks and infantry in the centre. The cavalry on the right flank of the Royalist army was under the direct command of Prince Rupert himself. The infantry in the centre, the musket and shot, were under Lord Astley. With the reserve of the King's lifeguard and Prince Rupert's blue coats in the rear, the cavalry on the Royalist left flank was under the command of Sir Marmaduke Langdale. The new model army, meanwhile, formed up in the same Swedish style, with cavalry on the flanks and infantry in the centre. The cavalry on the left flank were under the command of Sir Henry Ireton, the infantry in the centre under the command of Sergeant Major Philip Skippen, and the cavalry on the right were under the command of Oliver Cromwell. The Royalists had sacrificed their favourable position at East Farndon for Dust Hill, and strategic impetus now lay with the new model army, whose strength numbered approximately 14,000 men in total, and comprised 7,000 foot, 6,000 horse, and 676 dragoons. The Royalists, on the other hand, fielded approximately 7,500 men, which comprised 4,100 horse and 3,300 infantry. So we're right in the thick of it now, aren't we, Steve? We are right in the nitty gritty of what we've come to talk about, isn't it? This, this is the, the centre, uh, you know, th this is ground zero of Naseby. This is where yeah. everything was happening. So we are kind of in between both lines at the moment. Parliament would have been just behind us, uh, just on the other side of the crest of that hill. Uh, Fairfax was purposefully hiding his, his numbers from the enemy. And the Royalists would have been across Broadmoor, yep. just on the crest of the hill over there. And the position where we are specifically at the moment is where, uh, where the infantry would have clashed. So right in front of us is where the pipemen would have been going in at push a pipe, those, those tucks would have been uh, drawn and there'd be the knives going in, punches thrown, everything. Uh, so this, this is you know, the, the nucleus of Naseby itself. And now we've got uh, cr the Cromwell uh, monument just off to our left, which we'll go and visit in, in a moment. But uh, yeah, th this is it. This is where the action happened. Mm. And Cromwell, who would have been just off to our right over there with his, with his iron sides commanding the right flank of uh, the parliamentarian horse. Uh, he actually saw a, an opportunity, which is where he sent forward uh, Colonel John Oakey, who commanded, I think it was about approximately 500 dragoons, which were, uh, at that point, they were, they were men who rode into battle on a horse, 
they dismounted. So they were mounted infantry. Mm. So he, th these guys would dismount. And what they did, to very good effect, over on Sulby Hedges, which is just out of shot over there, uh, which was the original uh, parish boundary hedge, mm. is the Oakey's Dragoons were on the other side of that hedge, and they were they were waiting for Rupert's horse on the um, right extremist flank of the Royalists to to move forward. And when they did, all hell uh, broke loose. This map of the battle, compiled only two years after the battle, gives a comprehensive view of the dispositions of the troops at roughly ten hundred hours on the morning of the battle. You can clearly see the cavalry formations, pikemen and musketeers, and at the bottom of the image is the village of Naseby itself. At the top left, you can see some hedgerows. These are known as Sulby Hedges. So Pete, these must be the, the famous Sulby Hedges then? They are indeed. So, as we know, Rupert came forward because he saw a commotion going on. Um, so he thought, right, need to engage, because obviously what Dragoons mm. are, they're shock troops, aren't they, at the end of the day? Um, so he came forward, hit but then hit this hedgerow, and not even a horse can get through here. But then obviously he got caught in interfilading fire from the dragoon. So he then had to bypass them in heavy fire. Then he hit the other parliamentarian cav cavalry, where he engaged them and actually broke them. They then ended up going across the battlefield. And with that, Rupert then headed into Naseby. And at that point as well, the parliament line was starting to falter a bit. And Thomas Fairfax saw this, and he's like, I need to bring up my reserve. So he then brought up all of his reserve to try and plug that hole to keep that line in, in shape. But with that, obviously Rupert and his cavalry end up going around the back to Naseby to try and hit their baggage train because obviously that's where all the spoils of war are going to be. And we know what cavalrymen like to enjoy the battle during the English Civil War period. They love robbing baggage trains while the battle's going on still. <laughs> Whilst Rupert's cavalry headed for the parliamentarian baggage train, the infantry in the centre of the battlefield were engaged in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. After exchanging initial volleys of musket fire, the pikemen closed at Bush of Pike. Meanwhile, Parliamentarian Master of Horse Oliver Cromwell had been patiently waiting for his opportunity to join the fight. What's impressed me the most about this battlefield, Steve, is just how well preserved the battlefield itself actually is. So like where we've been researching the accounts of what happened here, it's like just looking over to, over in that direction to which you're about to talk about, you can see everything happening in your, in your mind's eye to how it all played out because obviously that hedge along the bottom there it w wasn't there then but apart from that you got it just it just puts that picture in your in your head of what happens here now. It's very much a case of this is one of one of the best preserved battlefields that we've got in Britain. Yeah. It really is. As you've alluded to, the, the hedges, the hedge lines that you can see here, they wouldn't have been, been here during the English Civil War. Hedgerows at that point, pre-enclosure act, of course, were uh, you know parish boundaries such as Sulby Hedges. Mm. But here, the very ground that we stood on, this is where Cromwell and his cavalry, so his famous iron sides, this mm. is where they where they mustered. And indeed, once uh, once Rupert had moved forward and crashed through and uh, hit Ireton on the left flank of Parliament. Cromwell, being the uh, master of horse that he was, um, thundered down this uh, valley and went slamming into the left flank of the Royalist cavalry and um, smashed straight through them, routed them. And then one of the most decisive uh, turning points of the Battle of Naseby was Cromwell. He was a natural, he was a natural cavalryman. Mm. He really, really was. Mm. What he did is he swung a, a portion of his cavalry into, um, into the, the left flank of the Royalist uh, infantry in the centre because of course we've got the two blocks of Parliament and, and the uh, Royalists clashing just, just uh, off to our left here mm. and uh, engaging hand-to-hand -hand combat and uh, Cromwell had routed the enemy cavalry on, uh, on his right flank and he slammed the remainder of his own cavalry into the, uh, the enemy Royalist formation in the centre and he genuinely turned the tide of the battle. Mm, most definitely. And you just, you just sort, of, sort of feel it, can't you? Just, uh... What I've was yeah. Out? I've very, I've been lucky enough to to have done a, a battle reenactment mm. on on the actual uh, site of Naseby itself uh, many many years ago, and it's a magical site. If anyone's been to Edge Hill, it has that same mm. kind of feeling about it. And when the sun goes down here, there is that uh, real uneasiness about mm. it. It's a, it's a very um, it's a very emotional battlefield. It's yeah. got a lot to offer. It hasn't given up many of its secrets yet, no. but come and visit it. It's a cracking battlefield, and mm. Naseby 1645 do a phenomenal they do. job they, of uh, flying the flag. 
As the tide of the battle began to turn in favour of the new model army, in part to Cromwell committing his cavalry, but also due to Fairfax utilising his reserve, the Royalist infantry in the centre began to turn tail and withdraw from the field. As they did, a fighting retreat ensued, beginning at Dust Hill. So Steve, where we are now is a place called Dust Hill and I believe this is where one of the greatest acts of bravery took place during the battle. So, as we know, Prince Rupert, he commanded cavalry, but he also had infantry under his command as well. But at this moment in the battle, Prince Rupert is trying to rob the baggage train in Nays Bay. <laughs> but his, um, his infantry are actually still on the field of battle, and it's at this very place here where his, his infantry stood like a, a wall of brass, it was said, where they constantly tried to repulse parliamentarian attacks. And also, when the Royalist army then went into retreat, they then still stood like a wall of brass to try and hold off the parliamentarians as long as they could before they too then ended up fight, doing a fighting withdrawal back to where they come from. And of course, Naseby being um, the, the battlefield where Parliament's new model army blooded itself for the, for the first time in more mm. ways than one, of course. Mm. 14 miles from the battlefield all the way back to Le Leicester, the, the Royalists were harangued by the parliamentarian they forces. Were. And you know, th this stand here was the first of many. And we'll, we'll walk a little bit further up the road and we'll go and visit a place called Wadborough Hill next. Let's go. From Dust Hill, we make the short journey to Marston Trussell Church which on the afternoon of the 14th of June, 1645, played host to the Royalist retreat and witnessed terrible acts of violence and murder. So now, Steve, we are on one of many of the, of the routes, aren't we now? So yeah, this is, this is Marston Trussell uh, Church and Churchyard, mm. of course. This is one of the, the locations that the Royalists were chased down by the parliamentarians and, and were butchered, to mm. be quite honest. There's, there's no other way of, of no, saying it now. Many of the soldiers were killed here. Many of the royalist horse were caught in the sort of bottleneck here. Um, but also, you have to, we have to mention the, the fact that many of the camp followers um, were killed here. And mm. they say, the well, legend goes in excess of 100 uh, camp followers, of course, women, uh, mainly Irish, Welsh, were, were killed here. Um, but also many more were, um, were cut across the nose as well. And they were given mm. the mark of the prostitute. and something they had to carry for the rest of their life. And uh, just to the east of here, uh, there's a field, and it was called Slaughter Ford, uh, which over the years has been slimmed down to Slawford. But Slaughter Ford is called that because there's a ford, mm. and many men were slaughtered there. So, that, that, again, place names, uh, they give you a real uh, sense of, of what the carnage was going on at this mm. point post-battle. And it has to be remembered and reinstated again that for, for no less than 12 miles, the Royalists were chased by the parliamentarians all the way back to the gates of Leicester. Absolutely, and looking back on it, people today would say this was absolutely horrific, but you gotta think how they're thinking at the time as well, where it's like they're there yeah. to destroy the enemy, and that's what they were doing. In their eyes, mm. that's what they were doing. Yeah, they naturally got you know the women and the civilians that got caught up in that, yeah. um, where the model army didn't give a good account of themselves um, at all, but when you're in hot pursuit of that enemy, the idea is to destroy that enemy because you don't want mm. that enemy filled in battle ever again. Yeah, and that, that's exact, exactly what happened. And it's worthwhile mixing into the story here as well, the story of Sir John Norwich. Now, Sir John Norwich, uh, he was in charge of a place called Rockingham Castle, mm. which is only, I believe, six miles uh, northeast of, as the crow flies from here. Now, Sir John Norwich doesn't really get mentioned in the Battle of Naseby. But it's worthwhile mentioning it because there's a village of Clipston, which is just to the southeast of where we are now. And that's where the Royalist baggage train was and many of its artillery pieces. Now, Sir John Norwich had a force of 500 men or thereabouts. And he'd shadowed the Royalist army down from Leicester and kept tabs on them. And when the Royalist army gave battle at Naseby, Sir John Norwich went in, into Clipston, and assaulted and attacked the baggage train and kept them in check. So that kind of eastern corridor away from the battlefield was very much closed for the Royalists. So they mm. had to head north and they, they headed all the way back up from Marston Trussell, back to where they started the day at Market Harbour. Leaving Marston Trussell, we make the short journey to what is known as the ROC viewpoint. From here, we are afforded a strong vantage point in which to better understand the outcome and legacy of the battle. So we're here, Peter, what's called the uh, ROC uh, viewpoint. So in yes. a moment, we'll go and have a look 
Uh, we've actually got a post-World War II Royal Observer Corps bunker and viewing platform as well. And uh, we'll head up into there now and we'll talk about the, uh, the legacy and outcome of the Battle of Naseby. Indeed. Let's go and have a look. So the Battle of Naseby, 14th of June, 1645, arguably the most decisive battle fought during the English Civil Wars. Not only did Charles and the Royalist Corps lose the majority of their main actual field army, many of their, their cannons, their, their horse and foot, but more importantly, many documents, uh, handwritten letters from Charles himself were actually captured by Parliament and within days they were reprinting these letters which outlined uh, Charles's call for the uh, Irish to come over and assist, yeah. assist the royalist cause as well as even the French as well and Parliament saw these uh, uh, you know they were acts of treason to, to, the, uh, to the English people so with the capture of those letters Parliament used them as propaganda and it used it to, to great effect because in 1649 they formed the basis of evidence that Charles was seen to be committing treason against the people of England. And of course, in January 1649, Charles I was beheaded. He was indeed, yeah. And I think the other thing on this as well is, yes, it's one of the most decisive battles as well, but it also showed the professionalism of the new British army as well. Obviously, they didn't show a good account of themselves here from the aftermath of the battle, which was quite horrific. Um, but yeah, that is the foundation of what we have as the British Army today. And that's where the history was made on this field. It is indeed. And the new model army, I mean, dare we say, that it was, they were blooded. They cut their teeth on, on these fields. And you could almost say and argue the fact that it was the first battle, arm, battle honour that mm. the British Army ever won. Of, of course, not in the nicest of circumstances. Naseby was a resounding victory for the new model army. This new professional army had cut its teeth and was fast becoming a force to be reckoned with. At Naseby, the Royalists suffered 4,500 men captured and over 1,000 killed or wounded. Parliament, on the other hand, counted 400 killed or wounded. Although these figures are educated estimates, it demonstrates the decisive blow that King Charles and the Royalists were dealt at Naseby. Less than a month later, on the 10th of July, 1645, the New Model Army crushed what remained of the Royalist Field Army at the Battle of Langport. Fought in the Royalist stronghold of the West Country, Fairfax's new model army, numbering 10,000 men, faced off against 7,000 men under Goring. The latter, who had not been present at Naseby after the King had opted to split his Royalist force. The First Civil War, as it has become known, began in 1642 and ended in 1646 following the turning over of Charles to Parliament by the Scottish. It would be two years of relative peace before the Second English Civil War would come into being. Naseby is often remembered as the definitive battle of the English Civil War, and never again would Charles be able to wield a force with the capability to achieve victory. The battlefield today is fairly accessible and well preserved, and under the guidance and curation of Naseby 1645, it is in safe hands for future generations to learn from and enjoy. A huge thanks for watching, don't forget to like, share and subscribe and even consider joining our Patreon to help us make more content for all to enjoy.